topic of our program this evening is an update on the progress of the construction of the new Tappan Zee Bridge. And we are lucky enough to have two representatives from the agency, the state agency, that is overseeing the construction of this absolutely awesome, awesome component of our infrastructure. We have Andrew P. O'Rourke, Jr., the son of our former Westchester County Executive, Andrew O'Rourke, and we also have Daniel Marcy, who will be the chief spokesperson in terms of giving us an update on what is happening at this point with the construction of the, the new bridge. They are, again, from the new New York Bridge of the New York State Thruway Authority. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Daniel Marcy. everybody, how are you guys doing? Um, thank you Jeff for a nice introduction. Uh, my name is Dan Marcy, I work for the New York State Thruway Authority as part of the Tappan Zee Bridge Project, uh, also dubbed the New New York Bridge Project, uh, along with my colleague in, uh, in the back, Andy O'Rourke. Uh, so I'm going to take you through a presentation today and explain to you what's going on uh, with the construction. Um, so for a little bit of history, uh, why we're building the Tappan Zee Bridge, uh, the structure was initially built back in the 1950s. Uh, estimated to hold about 100,000 cars a day. Now we have 140,000 cars crossing the bridge uh, in average daily traffic. Uh, and the, the amount of money that it would cost to maintain the structure was, uh, was rising steadily. Uh, and that, that cost was getting comparable to the amount it would take to build a new bridge. So instead of uh, spending a lot of money to maintain the existing structure and only getting a few decades out of it uh, for service life, it made more sense to build a crossing that's going to last at least 100 years uh, without needing major maintenance. So that's one of our requirements. Uh, we've been constructing the bridge since 2013, uh, and this is what we are building towards. Uh, so this is a rendering of the new Tappan Zee Bridge. Uh, it, this is a cable state crossing. Uh, it's a newer type of uh, crossing, especially for New York State. Uh, but there are a few other bridges like this that are getting built in the area. Um, so this may resemble a suspension bridge, the George Washington Bridge that connects New York City oh, and New sure. Jersey. That's a suspension bridge. Uh, cable stays uh, operate a little bit differently, uh, and you'll see these get built more, uh, more and more over the future because these are more cost effective to build. Uh, so I mentioned there are a few other bridges that, uh, like this getting built in the area. Uh, the Port Authority that owns uh, the George Washington Bridge, they're replacing another one of their structures that connects Staten Island to New Jersey. That's the Gothels Bridge. That's also a twin span, open angled tower, cable stay design. It looks a whole lot like ours, except we were first. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. <laughs> Uh, the Kosciuszko Bridge that connects Brooklyn and Queens in New York City, that's also getting replaced with a cable stay. Uh, so in a few years, in addition to the Tappan Zee, uh, you'll see a few other cable stays in the area. And yes, we are building two structures, so one bridge going from Rockland to Westchester, the other bridge going from Westchester back to Rockland. Um, so I want to get us started off with a quick time-lapse video It's going to show you some of the progress that we've made and some of the stats. Um, so please take a look. Our new Tappan Zee Bridge is an exciting symbol of what we can accomplish. A bridge that other administrations couldn't even begin is now moving forward. It's rising from the Hudson like our aspiration is rising for this state.
So that is a nice introduction to, uh, to the Tappanzee Bridge. Uh, you know, we have a lot of people working out on the, on the crossing, you know, upwards of a thousand people or more at peak construction, uh, and thousands more across the country that have uh, had a hand in building the bridge. Uh, and I'll explain to you a little bit more about you know, where, some of our, uh, where some of our materials uh, come from. Um, and here's another night rendering of the Tappan Zee. We're going to have a dynamic LED lighting scheme, uh, sort of like the Empire State Building in New York City. So we'll be able to change the, the color of those towers and cables uh, with the push of a button on the computer. So we can celebrate, uh, celebrate things that happen here in the Hudson Valley or in the New York area. So if the Yankees win the World Series, we can make it blue and white. Uh, the Mets can put it together, we can make it orange and blue. Uh, and so that will that'll be a nice change. Um, and I'm sure, as, as many of you know, we've been trying to build the bridge uh, for much longer than we've actually, uh, before we began construction. One of the first elected officials in New York to talk about replacing the Tappan Zee was former Governor George Pataki uh, back in 1999. Um, and that did get the project started, uh, but it wasn't just for building the Tappan Zee. It also included building a 30-mile rail corridor going from Suffern and Rockland County all the way over to East Chester on uh, this side of the river. Um, but the eminent domain decisions as far as who would have to move out of their homes and neighborhoods to make way for, the, uh, for all those train tracks and stations proved to be really difficult. Um, the project never really got off the ground. Uh, when Governor Cuomo came into office, he refocused it to take mass transit out as an official component. He wanted to make sure that we started working on the bridge before we had an issue with the crossing, but also wanted to make sure that the new bridge didn't stand in the way of future transit. So the new Tappan Zee Bridge, uh, the foundations are being built with the structural capacity to handle uh, future commuter rail or light rail. Uh, you know, the engineers tell me the easy thing to do is put a train on a new bridge. The more difficult question though is what does that train connect to when you get back on land? Uh, so once we do have the ability to create that corridor, uh, the new bridge will be able to handle that train. Uh, and I'll explain to you later on where, uh, where the train would go. Uh, and Governor Cuomo also got the pro project fast tracked by the Obama administration in 2011. That allowed us to speed through our permitting process. Normally a project of this size takes about six to seven years uh, to get all the state and, and federal environmental permits in a row. Uh, and that's because those state and federal agencies generally would work one after the other. Uh, the fast tracking program allowed all those agencies to work at the same time. So instead of taking six to seven years, we got all of our permits done in 11 months. Uh, and also important, uh, one other important thing that the governor was able to accomplish was getting a design build legislation uh, passed in New York State. And that changes the way uh, the procurement is done on a project like this. So the old way of doing, uh, of doing business would have been a design bid build uh, situation. Uh, and that generally results in a lot of cost overruns and delays. And I'm sure uh, you're all familiar with large infrastructure projects going over schedule and going over budget. Uh, and design bid build uh, contributes to that because under that scenario, so we, the Thruway Authority, would have found a consultant to design the new Tappan Zee Bridge. We have taken that design and put it out to bid amongst various contracting firms. Um, during, so we would also, uh, we would ultimately awarded the contract to the low bidder and they would have begun construction. During the construction phase, you know, that contractor may have found an issue with our design and said, hey, you know, you have some flaws here. We're going to have to uh, reassess uh, some, uh, some of these scenarios uh, to be able to build a you know, functional bridge. Uh, and that would result in a lot of overruns and delays, which would be borne by the state and filtered down to the toll payers because we were the owners of the design. Design build works differently, though, in that we did not design this bridge. Uh, the team that's building it, they're called Tappan Zee Constructors. I'll explain who they are in a few minutes. They designed this bridge, uh, also you know, going from the foundation pilings underneath the river all the way up to the towers and all its components, as well as the cost and schedule. Uh, and the other two bidding teams uh, also designed uh, their own unique, uh, own, their own unique structures. So. Uh, the contractor can't come to us and say, hey, we have a problem with our own design. Uh, that would be on their shoulders to fix. Unless there is uh, a directive from the state and the thruway authority to Tappan Zee constructors, most cost overruns and delays are borne by uh, the contractor. So it shifts a lot of the risk uh, from the public sector back over to the private sector. Um, so we've also gotten a good amount of state support on the project. Uh, New York State has invested $2 billion into the Thruway Authority, uh, and that is to help uh, stabilize tolls across the entire 570-mile uh, highway system, and also to help with uh, bridge construction costs. Uh, that money came from some bank settlement funds. There were some New York City investment banks like BNP, Paribas, they committed some violations and had some significant state and federal fines. About $6 billion went to the state 
two billion of which is allocated to the throughway uh, to help with that toll stabilization and with construction costs. We also got a good amount of federal support, uh, namely in the form of a $1.6 billion TIFIA loan from the U.S. Department of Transportation. Uh, TIFIA stands for Transportation Infrastructure Financing Innovation Act. Uh, at the time of our award, we were the largest project to date, but there have been a few uh, that have surpassed us in dollar amounts. Um, and here's an image of President Obama visiting the job site back in May of 2014. Uh, he came to uh, our construction site to tout that fast tracking program. Now, there are many roads, bridges, and tunnels across the country that need to be rebuilt. You know, it would be good if we could, are able to cut through some of that red tape. So who actually is Tappan Zee Constructors? So this is the, uh, this is the winning team that, is, uh, that was awarded the contract to build the new bridge. They're headlined by four primary construction firms, uh, Floor, uh, Granite Construction, American Bridge, and they were involved in the original Tappan Zee construction back in the 1950s, um, as well as Trailer Brothers. Their lead designer, HDR, actually used to have local headquarters uh, in Rockland County, but they've since moved over to Mawa, New Jersey. Now, why did Tappan Zee Constructors get the, uh, get the bid over the other two teams? They had the shortest construction schedule, five years, two and a half months. The other two teams were estimating to take closer to six years. They also proposed to do the least amount of dredging. So dredging is a process of going into the river and scooping up some of the top layers of soil and sediment to create more underwater clearance. Uh, the river, uh, the, the water at the Tappan Zee site is actually really shallow. Um, and underneath the, uh, the, or in between those main span towers is a deep, deep water channel. It's only 40 to 50 feet deep there. It gets really shallow as you get closer towards the shorelines, around 8 to 10 feet. So uh, all teams had to do, uh, had to do some dredging. Uh, Tap and Z constructors estimated to do about half as much uh, as the highest competitor. Uh, so that's much more environmentally friendly. Uh, they were the low bidder amongst the three uh, amongst the uh, the three teams at 3.142 billion dollars, and yes, that's still a lot of money. Um, the other two teams came in at 3.99 billion and 4.06 billion. Uh, but this is a design build procurement, and it's not low bid that automatically gets you the contract. It's what's determined to be best value. Price is about half of that equation, uh, but there are a number of other metrics that determine uh, what best value is. And the total project cost is $3.98 billion. Uh, the difference between that 3.1 figure and the 3.9 figure uh, is that we, the Thruway Authority, had to go out and hire an owner's engineer. Uh, and we're generally in the business of maintaining a highway, not building uh, you know, two, mega, uh, you know, two, uh, two large bridges. Uh, so we hired a, a firm there called HNTB. They uh, were involved in the Leonard Zakem Bridge project. Uh, that's a cable stay crossing right next to where the Celtics play uh, in Boston. Um, so they help us to do our, uh, they help us with our compliance and oversight, and there are also some contingency and financing costs that ultimately get you to that 3.98 figure. Um, so what does you know 3.9 3.98 billion dollars get you? Uh, so this bridge uh, is designed to last 100 years without needing any major structural repairs or maintenance. Uh, minor things like paving the road and striping the road will happen as needed. Some of the cables coming down from, those, from the main span towers actually get replaced after about 60 years, uh, but we shouldn't have to shore up the foundations or reapply a concrete road deck for at least a century. Uh, the bridge is going to reduce congestion. We'll have eight wider traffic lanes, uh, emergency lanes, and, uh, as well as breakdown lanes. Uh, right now on the existing bridge, we only have general traffic lanes with no shoulders and no medians. And that really uh, contributes to the accident rate. Uh, the existing bridge has double the average accident rate of any other three mile stretch along our highway system. Uh, so we're trying to engineer some of those, uh, engineer some of those problems out. Uh, I'll show you some, uh, a layout of the new bridge versus the existing, uh, and, and I'll show you, you know, what some of those improvements are going to be. Uh, the new crossing is also going to have a bike and pedestrian path. Uh, so you'll be able to walk and uh, walk and bike all the way across the bridge over into Rockland County. Uh, and we're building it uh, ready for future bus rapid transit and or rail. Uh, so the structural capacity for rail is being built into the foundations now. So when we're able to uh, make that uh, make that train corridor in the future, we won't have to go back into the river uh, to refortify the bridge. It's being built with that capacity uh, at this time. Uh, so, he, so I also mentioned, or actually forgot to mention, that we went to cashless tolling. That was one of the ways that we're reducing congestion. So as part of construction, we had to demolish the toll plaza that used to exist on the Westchester side of the bridge, that 12-lane toll plaza. And that was to allow Tappan Zee constructors to build the landing of the, uh, uh, build the Westchester landing of the bridge. 
So in the meantime, we built this gantry. It's over on the Rockland County side of the bridge. It allows you to drive through at highway speeds, whatever that is at the time. Uh, and you can, it reads your easy pass as you pass through. If you don't have an easy pass, there are cameras mounted. It takes a picture of your license plate, and you get a bill in the mail once a month. Uh, so this allows, um, this allows traffic to flow much more easily, especially in the eastbound direction. Uh, and this system will be uh, relocated back to the Westchester side uh, once construction is complete. Uh, so to date, Tap and Z Constructors has, uh, has had a good amount of economic impact on the region. Uh, they've uh, signed or committed to spend about $2.21 billion, $800 million of which are for permanent materials, things like the materials for the concrete uh, and the steel needed to build the bridge. Those were the two primary components. Uh, $978 million of which going towards subcontractors. Tap and Z Constructors has over 1,600 subcontractors around the country supplying them with goods and services and about $437 million of which going towards indirect expenses. Uh, a good chunk of that indirect expense had to deal with the self-insurance payment that TZC had to handle before they could start mobilizing in the river. So I mentioned that they have a number of subcontractors around the country, uh, almost uh, over, over 1,600, nearly 700 of which are based here in New York State, and while we would love to have all of those subcontractors based here in New York, this project is way too large to get all the materials uh, just from New York, and also because we accepted those federal dollars as part of that TIFI loan, you have to open up opportunity to the rest of the country. Uh, but we also have a Buy American provision on the project, so all the steel has to, has to be sourced domestically within the United States. Um, and if you look at the bottom of the screen, that's the local county breakdown. Uh, we have 192 firms here in Westchester County uh, working on the project. Uh, 90 over in Rockland County, 67 in New York City, and 39 where I'm from up in Orange. Uh, there's also a, dis a disadvantaged business enterprise goal on the project. Uh, DBE is a firm that's at least 51% owned by a woman minority or veteran. Um, they have a 10% goal of the $3.142 billion contract going to Tap and Z Constructors. Um, or $314 million. So we're just over three quarters of the way towards our DBE goal, and we're not yet that far in overall construction progress, so we're making good efforts on our DBE front. Uh, and to date, there have been about 5,800 people that have worked on the project in some fashion or another. Um, and that's not necessarily at the bridge site. We actually have staging areas across the state and across the country. Uh, some, some materials come as far west as Washington State or California. So nationwide to date, there have been about 5,800 people uh, who've had a hand in building the Tappancy Bridge. Uh, so I want to show you how our job site has progressed over the, uh, over the last few years. Uh, so these are some webcam images taken from our uh, taken from uh, the project site. We have a few that are stationed around uh, around the construction zone, uh, and they take a picture essentially every 15 minutes. And it allows us to essentially build a, a time lapse video. Uh, but I'm going to show you some of those stills. So this image was taken back in the spring of 2014. Uh, the river is uh, not nearly as active as it is now. You can see that we're installing uh, some piles. If you look out towards the main span, you can also see some piles happening there uh, for our foundation. Uh, so moving forward into the spring of 2015, you know, more of the base of the bridge is really coming up. You can see that we're building some of our piers. Um, and then going forward uh, into the fall of uh, 2015, uh, the super crane's on site. Uh, that big crane is called the Eyelift New York Super Crane. It's one of the world's largest. Uh, that was originally originally built for the Oakland San Francisco Bay Bridge project out in California, uh, and we brought it over here to help work on the Tappan Z. That crane's been primarily installing those uh, those blue steel girder assemblies, uh, and those are constructed in a way that uh, they're very large. Uh, they're very large. Um, they're about 12 feet high, but 400 feet long. Uh, that's the only crane that we have on the, uh, on the project that's able to lift those into place. Um, and a more recent image. This was taken just last week. Uh, you can see that we've installed uh, much more of those steel girder assemblies. We've begun uh, placing our concrete deck panels. Uh, we've also started to put the overlay on top of those deck panels and uh, begin our barrier construction. Uh, so I believe this image was taken just last week, and if you look further out towards the main span, you can also see those towers uh, rising up in the middle of the river. So jumping over to the Westchester side, um, and reversing back to the spring of 2014, um, back then we were, were, we were working on the steel pilings for our main span. Um, and I'll show you a closer up image of those steel piles. You know, from far away, you really can't get a sense of how large they are. I have an image that I'll, that I'll show you in a few minutes uh, that gives you a sense of you know, how large they really are. Um, so jumping forward to the end of spring of 2015, we were getting ready to start building those main span towers. 
those blue boxes that you see, those are called jump forms, and we use those to help create and shape those towers. They actually self-climb up the towers via screw jack system as we complete each section. Um, so those towers have been, uh, have been rising since uh, the end of summer 2015. Uh, in the spring of this year, we installed prefabricated concrete cross beams to connect the two tower legs themselves. Uh, this bridge uses a lot of modular construction, meaning that we build, we pre-build certain elements off-site, uh, and then we bring them to the job already constructed and have cranes set them into place. Those cross beams weigh about 700 tons, uh, and that super crane is the only one that we have on the project that can lift those as well. Um, another in uh, interesting thing about that crane is that it came, uh, it came into New York uh, through New York Harbor and eventually up the Hudson River. We had to fit that crane underneath the Tappan Zee Bridge. And if you look at this picture, you might wonder how were we able to do that. Um, you're able to lower the boom of the crane, uh, but these, the back section here is about the same height as the road deck of the bridge. So what we did to get the, the crane underneath the, uh, underneath the Tappan Zee is that we had to wait for a full blood moon low tide, uh, and then we filled up the ballast tanks of the cranes with several million gallons of water, uh, and it just squeezed under the bridge by about five feet. Now, I've seen a picture of some of the people who were standing uh, on the crane here, and they were within arm's length of the, of the underside of the bridge deck. Um, and then here's a more recent image taken also just last week. Uh, we've completed our westbound towers. Uh, you can see that we're building two bridges here. Uh, so our westbound towers are, uh, have reached their full height at 419 feet. Uh, we're very close to completing, completing some of the eastbound towers, and we've also begun our cable stay installation. Uh, so going back to those, uh, going back to our foundations and our pile driving. So our piles they range in diameter from three feet, four feet wide, and some are six feet. Those are six foot diameter piles, and to give you a sense of how big they are, you know these are full size adults, uh, you know standing uh, standing next to them. Uh, so what we would do is we would drive a, the first section of our pile down into the river. They come in 150 to 175 foot sections, uh, and then we would need a crane to hoist a second section up because ultimately they go down on average about 300 feet uh, down to bedrock wherever possible, and we would have to weld the second section of the pile on site. So that's what's happening uh, in, in these welding tents over here. Uh, so we would weld the second section on site and then uh, complete uh, complete the pile driving process. Uh, so this is the noisiest part of construction when you're having to hammer these piles down. Uh, but one of the things that we found when we were doing our uh, soil investigations is that the soil, the top layers were soft enough that we could vibrate the piles down uh, initially. Uh, and that's a lot quieter, especially for the residents who live around uh, the Tappan Zee site. Uh, but once you get uh, to a depth low enough, you know, those vibratory hammers aren't strong, aren't really effective anymore, and that's when you have to bring out the impact hammer, uh, which slowly and rhythmically bangs the pile down. Uh, but we, uh, we also used um, underwater noise reduction to help protect you know, some of the endangered fish that are in the river. So, we have uh, a number of environmental monitors around the project to track noise, vibration, and air quality. Uh, all projects of our size have to keep track of this data. We actually go one step further and we uh, make it public and we put it on our website. So if you're interested to see you know, how loud construction noise was this morning, uh, you can log into our website and find, this, uh, find that data. It's also archived uh, so you can peel back the layers and see you know, what the noise levels or uh, emission levels were a few weeks ago. Uh, so I mentioned before that we use modular construction. Uh, each one of those dots on the on the screen, you know, represents a place where uh, where we have a fabrication uh, fabrication site for the bridge project. Um, but uh, some of the pieces that we are using for the bridge, like our pile caps that's on the bottom left, that is a uh, singular piece of concrete. It looks like a big bathtub uh, if you were look, if you were to look at it from above. It comes pre-cut with holes on the bottom, and that's actually the base that goes uh, that unifies our foundation piles right at the river level. Uh, so it's initially hollow when we uh, when we get it. We have to we have to fill it up with steel rebar and then pour concrete inside, uh, so then we can build on top. Those pile caps come from Virginia, uh, and they weigh anywhere from 300 tons to 600 tons. Uh, our pier caps, that is the piece right at the top here, those are also prefabricated down in Virginia. Uh, they come to the job site hollow as well, and then uh, we, uh, we install some rebar cages inside to help reinforce the concrete, and then fill up the entire cap itself with concrete from some of our batch plants. The vertical portions, though, we construct that on site, uh, so we'll make a, a steel skeleton out of uh, reinforcing bars, rebar, uh, and then encase that in formwork, pour concrete, and that's how you get the vertical portions. 
And our steel girder assemblies, those individual steel panels are built in Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina. They all get shipped to upstate New York at the port of Queemans, uh, which is along the Hudson River just south of Albany, where they get put together in larger assemblies and then we'll load them up onto barges or floating platforms, bring them down the river, at which point the super crane would install them. Um, the, that super crane actually installed the last girder assembly for this phase of construction. Um, so I'll explain, uh, explain to you what, how phase one and phase two of construction works, um, but you won't see any girder assemblies uh, installed uh, for at least another, another year. So this is an image taken up, uh, taken up at the Port of Queemans in Albany County. Uh, so these, uh, these pieces of steel are massive, and this picture gives you uh, a little bit of that sense of scale. Uh, so they're 12 feet high by 400 feet long. So these come in segments you know, that would take up the distance between home plate at Yankee Stadium or City Field if you're a Mets fan, going all the way out to the center field wall. Um, so they weigh anywhere from seven to 1,100 tons, uh, and our super crane is what puts them into place. Uh, another off-site staging area is in uh, northern Rockland County. This is Tompkins Cove, and this is where we fabricate uh, those steel re uh, the steel reinforcing bars uh, or steel rebar. Um, our rebar is galvanized through a hot dip zinc process. Most of the rebar that you're used to seeing, like if you've uh, seen a uh, sidewalk construction, you now that those uh, that steel that sticks up out of the ground usually has a rusty finish. Ours is galvanized to help prevent against corrosion. Uh, and this section of rebar is actually goes inside of those main span towers. Uh, what you're looking at here is an anchorage point uh, for one of the cable stays. So the, the, the cables start from the outside of the road deck and attach to the interior of the towers. Um, and speaking of those towers, what we've been using to construct them are these blue climbing forms. Uh, so those climbing forms, uh, they actually climb up the towers as we complete each segment. Each individual tower takes 26 pours or lifts uh, to complete, um, and then once we are and once we're ready to remove the forms, uh, we use those red tower cranes to disassemble them piece by piece. Uh, so those, some of those forms will be coming down uh, shortly. We've already removed those for the westbound span, uh, and we're in the process of completing our eastbound towers uh, right now. Uh, so the tower, the concrete for those towers is all sourced from these batch plants, um, and the bulk of the concrete from our uh, for our project is made right on the Hudson River. So instead of having to get our uh, most of our concrete from a factory and trucking it in uh, through the local streets, uh, we're able to source our concrete on the river. So these batch plants make 200,000 of the 300,000 cubic yards that we're using for uh, the bridge project. Most of the other concrete comes from those prefabricated sections. And we do have to truck in a small amount of concrete to the landings. Uh, because the river is so shallow, we can't bring these batch plants uh, that close towards the, towards the shorelines. Um, and this stat was in that initial video that you saw, but 300,000 cubic yards of concrete is a lot. And to put that into perspective, if you were to just make regular sidewalk panels using that much concrete, it would go from our bridge site all the way down to Key West, Florida, about 1,500 miles. It takes a lot of material to build these two three-mile bridges. Uh, 300,000 cubic yards of concrete, about 220 million pounds of steel, uh, 30 mil uh, sorry, 30,000 tons of that galvanizing rebar. Um, and how cable stays work is that the, the cables themselves, they transfer the load up from the road deck back into the towers. Um, and we've been used, this is a modern bridge, and we've used uh, modern technology to help us with our design. Captain Z Constructors has built a 3D BIM model that stands for Bridge Information Modeling. Uh, and it's a 3D map of the entire bridge. It has uh, about half a million data points on specific components, how are they supposed to be installed, in what order. And that's helping them out with construction. But they're going to give us uh, give that model to us the throughway when the bridge is done. And we'll be able to use that for maintenance. So in a few decades, if we do have to replace a certain component, we can reference that BIM model and know exactly how to go about doing construction. Um, and, the, and the fun thing about the project now is actually getting to see you know, that design go from a concept uh, to, uh, to reality. So it's, uh, it's really interesting to see that come into play out on the Hudson River. Uh, so we made this transition using, uh, using uh, some drone footage that we took a few months ago. Um, and I'm actually looking, looking forward to updating this video as well. Um, even shot just a few months ago, we only have you know, four cables coming off of that westbound tower there are now upwards of 30 cables coming off of that westbound tower. Uh, so we've made a lot of progress even since then. Um, how, many, how, how am I doing on time? You're awesome. good, Daniel. Okay, okay, we're good? Okay. Yeah. All right, just want to make sure that you guys aren't trying to get home, so I don't want to uh, take up too much of your time. I want to explain how we're also building the road deck coming out of, the, uh, coming out of those main span towers. So 
you start going from the cross beams uh, and, uh, and then start working your way out. And then once that road deck starts going out far enough from the towers, you can then begin your cable stay installation. Um, so this image that, that if you see that blue steel sitting yeah. resting above the cross beam, that's a structural steel uh, for the main span of the bridge. Um, and when I say main span, I'm just talking about the section here with those uh, with the sets of angled towers and the cable stays. The rest of the bridge, the other 85% of it uh, is your approach span. Uh, so the way that the cable stay installation works is that once your towers are constructed to a level high enough, uh, you can get begin uh, your road deck installation. So we'll have cranes come in and set those field sections of steel. Uh, we'll also install uh, road deck panels on top of it. And once that the road deck starts to splay out from the, uh, the bridge towers, we can begin our cable stay installation. So it's a delicate balancing act. You know, what you do on one side of the towers, you have to do on the other side. Um, and this work also requires us working in the main channel in between those towers. That's generally uh, the navigation channel that remains open. Uh, so we, we do have some channel closures that are happening, but we work, uh, we work closely with the Coast Guard as well as the shipping, uh, the shipping industry. So they're aware of you know, how their schedule may be impacting by, impacted by our construction. Uh, and the final piece of the main span is installing uh, the last section, the section of steel in between the two towers. Uh, so ultimately, uh, we're, this is a 1,200 foot span in between those towers. And the reason why you need the cable state uh, section of the bridge is to create uh, a channel wide enough and high enough for large boats to pass through. You know, if we didn't have big boats going underneath the huts, uh, underneath the Tappan Zee, you could just do uh, the approach span construction with those concrete piers holding up the roadway. Um, but since we need something wider than 300 feet, or sorry, 350 feet, which is the distance between our approach span piers, that's why you need the cable stayed section. So there are going to be 192 cables uh, strung between the towers. Um, and so the cables themselves, which you see uh, when you're driving across the bridge, you see an outside sheathing. Uh, so if you were to lay all those uh, the, the outside sheathing from end to end, that would be 14 miles of cable. Um, but it's uh, but you can unpack the layers of that. So out, inside those cables are a number of metal strands, um, and those are what really give the the bridge its uh, its structural rigidity. There are 700 miles of metal strands inside of those cables, and if you were to unpack those strands, you get about 4,900 miles of wire uh, inside all of those cables, helping to support about 74 million pounds of steel and concrete. Uh, here at the main span. So I also want to show you a quick time lapse of our first uh, of, of the first set of towers that we completed. So this is about uh, 12 months of construction, a little bit more uh, condensed down to just a minute, and you can see our towers uh, rise from the base uh, at the end of the summer 2015. Uh, we topped them out uh, at the beginning of October. So take a look. And I'll see if I can lower the volume so I can help narrate as this goes on. Uh, so the jump forms have been installed, we finished our pile cap base, um, and then the, you'll see the towers start to rise up with each individual section. Uh, those red tower cranes are designed to help uh, service, uh, help bring some of the materials from the river level up to the tops of the towers. I know they reach up towards the 419 feet, so there's nothing that we have that can reach from uh, the bottom of the river all the way up to those tower tops. We brought in uh, some temporary false work to support those cross beams that the super cranes installing. Uh, we finalized those connections with concrete from our batch plants. Uh, at some point, you'll see some of the steel, uh, steel get installed, uh, and then you'll see road deck and also cable stay installation. Um, and then once the towers reach their full height, we have the cranes remove the jump forms, and you can see our westbound towers have been completed. Um, our eastbound towers are, are near completion. If you go across the bridge, um, if you go across the bridge tomorrow, uh, you'll see some of those forms actually removed, and uh, the process should be finished within the next few weeks. Uh, so here's a uh, here's a more updated image of uh, actually this one's a, a few weeks old too, uh, but here's a more updated image of the uh, of the bridge. The eastbound towers actually more resemble what you see at the back here. Uh, so the eastbound towers uh, closer closer towards the Westchester side have now uh, risen up a little bit more, and their forms, if you draw, go across the river tomorrow, that's what you would see on these eastbound towers. These sets of towers actually have had those forms removed uh, already. So what, is the, what are we going to get out of this new bridge, and how is it going to be a benefit as far as just a driving experience? Uh, so here is a layout of the existing Tappan Zee Bridge. It's 87 feet wide. We have seven lanes of traffic, no shoulders, no medians, uh, and a movable barrier that allows us to always have four lanes going in peak direction. Uh, but some of the issues with our bridge is that the lane widths are pretty tight at 11 feet, and in some places get more narrow at 10 and a half. 
Um, and we also have a, uh, there's also a significant incline heading towards the main span. So if you're driving out of Rockland, you have a flat viaduct, and then you go up a 3% grade up to the main span. That proves uh, really difficult for your larger vehicles, like tractor trailers, um, and a train would never be able to make, up the, make it up that. So the existing bridge would not be mass transit capable. What we're doing with the new crossing is that that incline starts a lot sooner uh, coming out of the Rockland side, and it's much more gradual. So instead of being a 3% grade, it's one and a half. Uh, makes it much more gradual, but it tops out at the same height over uh, at the main span. Um, so the new bridge that we're building is two separate bridges. Uh, we're giving you uh, much more space. Uh, so there's four general traffic lanes on each crossing. Uh, we'll have extra wide shoulders as well as emergency lanes that have the potential to double uh, as an express bus lane. And the northern span is going to have uh, a bike and walking path. Now the, the, uh, the southern span, that's the eastbound roadway that goes from uh, that will go from Rockland to Westchester. Uh, this roadway is 87 feet, which is just as wide as the existing bridge. The northern span that will go from Westchester back to Rockland is even wider at 96 feet uh, because it will have that bike and walking path, but it also has to do with how we're gonna shift traffic from the current bridge onto the new spans. So here's how that, how that is going to work. We have the existing bridge uh, carrying traffic in both directions right now. Uh, Tappan Zee Constructors is building both crossings going from the middle out towards the shorelines and the northern span or westbound roadway will be completed first. And the reason why, we're, uh, reason why that's happening is that if you follow this, the line of the southern span, you can see that it's going to have to run into the existing bridge where it touches land on both sides of the roadway. So the way the traffic phasing will work is that we shift all traffic off the existing crossing onto the new westbound roadway. Uh, so in its temporary configuration, it's not going to have the extra wide shoulders or emergency lanes, uh, nor the shared use path. Then we're going to use the entire width, the 96 feet, for eight general traffic lanes, so one more lane of capacity than we do now. Uh, so four lanes going from Rockland to Westchester, another four going from Westchester back to Rockland. Once we make the tra traffic shift, we can start demolishing the existing bridge um, and then finish the, uh, the last few sections of the southern span uh, that we aren't able to reach just yet. And in 2018 at project completion, uh, you'll have the southern or eastbound roadway going from uh, Rockland to Westchester and the northern or westbound roadway going from uh, Westchester back to Rockland, and the existing bridge will be demolished. Uh, so here's an actual image uh, taken of the Rockland landing uh, to show you why we have to do uh, the traffic phasing in that manner. Uh, so to the top of the screen, that is the northern span that has connection into land. Uh, this is the existing crossing that we're driving on right now. And you can see that the southern span or eastbound roadway is going to run into the footprint of the existing bridge at the landing. Uh, so that's why we have to do the traffic phasing that way. It's the same story over on the Westchester side. Uh, the northern span has connection into land. The southern span will run into, uh, run into the existing bridge. Uh, so that is where phase one and phase two of construction comes from. So phase one is all of the northern span, that we, uh, the entire northern span, and as much of the southern span that we can reach until we have to start uh, demolition in that traffic shift. So we have uh, completed all the piers for phase one of construction. And a pier um, are these structures that you're looking at here holding up the steel. Uh, so we've done all phase one piers. Phase two uh, construction of those piers will begin once we've done that traffic shift. Um, I've also mentioned before that we have a lot of web cameras. So if you're interested to see what construction looks like, you can log onto your computers or smartphones. Uh, go to our website, newonlinebridge.com, and you can find our web cameras. Uh, there, uh, these, there are a number of views that are archivable. There's a unique uh, calendar function, so you can click on any particular date and see what the job site looked like uh, on that day or, and at any given time during that day. We also have another camera pointed at a falcon nest on the existing bridge. Um, the reason for the camera, it, it does happen to be a really big hit with the community and, a special, uh, and especially the schools, um, but the reason why we actually have the cameras is that the falcons are a protected species and we wanted to make sure that you know, we weren't impacting their, uh, their habitat, especially as those towers get closer uh, to the nest. Um, so there's a live camera pointed at the falcon nest. Uh, it's much more uh, exciting to watch right after the winter, after the adult falcons return. Uh, the last two years, they did hatch uh, some falcon chicks, so you could see the early life cycle of the birds. We actually had a naming contest with some of the local elementary schools, uh, and they were really inventive with the names they came up with. Uh, the first year, they had Hudson, Z, and Ridge, Ant, to, as they named the falcons. <laughs> Uh, there are also two viewing areas if you want to come check out the progress in person. Um, in, uh, in Rockland County, that's over at Memorial Park. Um, 
And in Westchester County, that's right next to the Terrytown Senior Center and at Scenic Hudson Riverwalk Park. Uh, there are viewing scopes that are free to operate, uh, and there are also informational panels in case uh, there's no one else there to tell you uh, specifically what you're looking at. Uh, they offer great views, uh, so I definitely recommend uh, checking those out. We also have two community outreach centers, one in Nyack, one in Terrytown. They're open seven days a week. Um, and those are places where you can go and get answers uh, to any questions that you have. Um, and if you like, you can also email our project hotline um, or give us a phone call uh, if you have any questions, concerns, or praise. Uh, and then we also have done a lot of community outreach uh, since the project has gotten, gotten underway uh, since 2012, over 800, uh, over 800 meetings. Um, and we also have an extensive educational outreach program, so if you have any children or grandchildren that go to school in the area, uh, we can come out and give them a presentation. Uh, it's different material than what you saw here today, more age appropriate. Um, and we try to get them thinking about uh, what's happening with the bridge project, their careers, potentially engineering, uh, and just to get them you know, more engaged uh, with their surroundings. Um, we also do a lot of uh, boater safety. Uh, this is the Hudson River is still an active zone for uh, the commercial uh, and recreational boating community, so we let them know what they're going to encounter when they get to our job site. We also have a GPS tracking map uh, that's also available online, so you can see you know, where some of our, where our barges and vessels are. Uh, the red dots indicate some, uh, a vessel that hasn't moved for 10 minutes. Uh, at least uh, the green arrows are vessels in transit, and the yellow icon signifies the location of the super crane. Um, and then lastly, uh, we, are, uh, we are building that, uh, that bike and walking path. Uh, so here is a proposed concept of, uh, of the landing area in Rockland County. This would be part of a side path of the Esposito <coughs> Trail, um, and where that connects in South Nyack. Uh, and there are six scenic overlooks along that uh, along that uh, shared use path. So the path is going to run along the northern span. Uh, the first overlook on the Rockland County side is Fish and Ships. It plays off the marine culture of Nyack. Uh, moving across the river, you have Palisades. You know, playing uh, that uh, you know, plays homage to you know the geography of the Hudson Valley. Uh, Painter's Point, you know, that structure frames your view of the river. There's also some stadium seating beyond that, sort of like the Highline Park in New York City. Uh, the overlooks have uh, integrated bike parking built into, uh, into the walls. Uh, coming across the river again, you have River Crossing that talked about some of the prior forms of transportation along the Hudson. Uh, now we're on the Westchester side of those main span towers, uh, Half Moon, uh, like the ship that Henry Hudson took um, centuries ago. Uh, and then lastly, you have the Tides of Terrytown. Uh, this one is interesting because it allows you to see over traffic to the New York City skyline, so you can step on the seating structure to see over traffic, but you, if you aren't able to do that, uh, the shading is uh, developed out of some highly polished stainless steel. Uh, so what this, is what this is actually a periscope, uh, essentially a periscope function, uh, a reflection coming on off of the uh, off the shade you know, above, so you'd still be able to see a live stock shot of New York City uh, if you aren't able to climb up onto that seating structure. And then here is the welcome area that is going to be on the Westchester side of that shared use path. And we're also building uh, some separate buildings as part of the construction. We had to uh, tear down a maintenance facility for the New York State Thruway as well as a uh, state trooper barracks. Uh, so this uh, a new maintenance facility is going to be built right where that shared use path comes into Westchester County. And then on the other side of the highway is where the new state trooper barracks uh, will, will be located. Um, so that essentially is our presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Um, so we have navigational uh, navigation lights that are essentially uh, right underneath the road deck of the existing bridge, and they illuminate uh, the navigation channel. Uh, so there is, you know, it's a 1,200-foot wide channel. The 600-foot uh, middle uh, middle portion of that is lit, you know, during construction to help, you know, to help those larger uh, larger vessels pass through. Yes. Gene Duress. Uh, uh, I'm an engineer, so I have a couple of questions. I'm not an engineer, but go ahead. <laughs> um, you have to be aware of this climate change. With climate change, these 
seat voting is rising. <coughs> so what provisions exist for the steep rivers that are going to rise as a result of when the tides come in? It's a tidal river. So his question had to do with um, what or, or, or how is the bridge going to be able to handle sea level rise? Um, so we have uh, we have studied uh, the potential rise of the Hudson River over the service life of the project, and it is not uh, it's not estimated to impact the crossing itself. Um, you may have some issues with you know some of the uh, surface streets, especially over on the Rockland County side, which is really low. But the cross the bridge crossing itself uh, will not be affected by that uh, by the expected rise. No, we don't. So, so his, uh, his further rejoinder was that uh, the rising water would lower the clearance of the main span for those larger ships. Um, so now the bridge does not have the ability to open up. We are maintaining our current clearance of 138 feet. Um, one of the reasons why we're not increasing it was uh, was the direction of the U.S. Coast Guard, but also. The bridges to the north of us, some of them have a lower clearance, so even if we were to raise ours, you know, those ships would still have an issue getting under some of the bridges to the north of the Tappan Zee along the Hudson. Ken Nielsen? Seventy percent of the piles go to bedrock. There's a channel closer toward the Rockland County side where we did our geotechnical investigations. We went down around six or seven hundred feet, and we never found bedrock. So we don't know how deep it is in a certain channel over on the Rockland approach. Uh, and those locations we're using what are what's called friction piles. Uh, so they're a little bit thinner. They go a little bit deeper, um, and it's the underwater force and tension that holds those into place. I'm told that's a common engineering practice. Um, the other, the remaining 70% of our piles do hit bedrock, and that's on average about 300 feet. The, 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 the pilings for the main span towers, those go down to bedrock. Uh, so the existing bridge, the main span is actually floated by these buoyant caissons. Um, that was technology that was used back in the 1950s. We've advanced past that. We don't, uh, we don't need to use the, you know, that type of foundation for the new bridge. So we're using steel pilings that go to bedrock wherever possible. I'm going to clarify, but yes. Andrea Wagner had a question. Yes. Um, I wanted to know how long it takes to demolish the existing bridge, and where does all that debris go? Okay, is good question. Um, so if you couldn't hear a question on the other side of the room, she asked, you know, how long does it take to demolish the current bridge and what happens to the material? Uh, so the demolition will start uh, in about a year from now when we make that first traffic shift. Uh, it takes about a year to demolish the uh, to demolish the crossing. Uh, you know, project completion is two completed bridges and a demolished existing Tappan Zee bridge. As far as the material, uh, Tappan Zee Constructors has rights to the steel, so they can uh, take that, melt it down, and repurpose it into new steel. Some of the road deck panels were recently installed within the last 10 years. Uh, a portion of those are going to be reclaimed by the state uh, and used elsewhere throughout New York State Thruway or Department of Transportation projects. Um, and then you know, we're in the process of determining what happens to the rest of the material. So there may be some groups that apply for concrete rubble to you know, fill a fishing reef. Uh, we're in the process of dealing with that right now. Jason Schiano and then Mag. Uh, presumably there's some time and money built into the project for contingencies. Have you run into anything unexpected yet? Um, can you repeat the question? <laughs> I, I presume there was some time and money built into the project for unexpected situations. Yes. Um, Have you run into anything that they didn't plan for yet? Sure. Um, so you know, when you're, you have an idea of you know, what it's going to be like to build you know, your two, uh, three mile crossings, um, one of the things that uh, that happened you know, before construction is that you know, the Hudson River uh, remained unfrozen for about 10 years before construction began, and then once we got, the, uh, got construction underway, <laughs> the first two years we had uh, really cold winters uh, and, the, and the river froze over. Um, but Tappan Zee Constructors actually, you know, actually accounts for cold weather, uh, so they've built you know, a two-month two shutdown into each calendar year, you know, so, they look, so they try to you know, mitigate you know, those factors you know, that may come about. Maggie Collins. Largest bridge project in the United States, or at one time the biggest project in the world, bridge 
I, I can't account for the world. Uh, for, uh, at one point, it definitely. Uh, at one point, it was the largest, uh, large bridge and highway project uh, in, in the in the states by dollar amount. There are other, uh, you know, infrastructure like rail corridor projects that are larger than us by uh, by dollar amount now. Um, and I'm not exactly sure, you know, what else is on the uh, on the federal register. Uh, but at one point, we were, you know, the large dollar amount project. Anyone else? Ken Nielsen. No, no other question. Uh, if you, if, if it became feasible to put in heavy rail, I understand the foundations are, uh, are there, but what would you have to do to be able to accommodate heavy rail going across the bridge? Okay, let's see if we can find a good. So the uh, it would be either commuter rail or light rail. We couldn't, we could not handle freight. Uh, the the foundations are not be, are not built to handle the, the load of freight rail, uh, but a commuter rail or a light rail would. And the tr crossing would uh, that train would go in between uh, the two spans. Uh, so Tappan Zee constructors, one of their requirements, and actually a requirement of all the bidding teams, was to explain to us how we could make the provisions for uh, transit in the future. So it would go in between the two crossings. Um, at the main span, uh, there would, the towers would be connected at the top. We would run some extra cable stays uh, to support a third roadbed. Uh, I'm less familiar with the process of how it's connected on the approaches. I have, uh, I have seen, uh, seen some of those documents. Um, but it would go in between the two, uh, in between the two spans. So it wouldn't go on either of the... Would not go on... It, it, it would be, it would be a second, it would be second roadbed, it would be at, at the same grade, or at the same level as the, uh, as the roadways. Um, but it would go in between the two spans, uh, and that's how the connection would work. Okay. None. Uh, what is the question about new tolls? So, um, no, I do not have an answer as to what the future toll is going to be. Uh, they're going to remain at the current level until at least 2020, uh, at which point they may rise or a, determ or a determination will be made. It's not, uh, it's not set in stone that the tolls are going to rise as of 2020, but they will have to go up at some point to pay for the construction. Uh, so at some point they, uh, they will rise. Um, we said that they will they be consistent with other Hudson River crossings, and we're trying to keep them lower than your, your New York City bridges. You know, we don't want to price people out. You know, being able to commute across from Rockland to Westchester and vice versa. Diana Verrill. I, I hate to bring this up, but I am very curious. Uh, there are many people in the past who have chosen to use the Tappan Zee Bridge as the George Washington Bridge as a diving place into the water. What provisions are being made to protect the sides? Okay. Good question. So, uh, for those who couldn't hear, her question had to do with uh, what are we doing to present, uh, prevent people from potentially committing harm to themselves on the crossing? Um, so, we are developing, uh, we're installing anti-climb fencing along all the fascia or the sides of the bridge. Uh, so, fencing that's difficult to get a handhold or a foothold into. Um, there's no 100% uh, way to prevent somebody from doing that, but we, you, the idea is trying to deter it uh, to the best of the, the best of our ability. So we're going to be inviting people to walk out onto the bridge, especially with that bike and walking path. So we'll have that uh, that tensile mesh netting there that, that's going to that's anti-climb, uh, and that's to uh, you know, help make it, to make it more difficult uh, for someone to uh, get themselves over the bridge. Anyone else? We have Gene, then we have Caesar, and that'll do it. Thank you. Who's providing quality control for the cement and concrete that you're using? Uh, so, this question was, who's providing quality control for the concrete and cement that, uh, that we're using? Um, so, we have, uh, we have some uh, engineers on the state side uh, that help us with that quality control process, um, and also with the firm HNTB, they help us to make sure uh, that concrete is going to meet that 100-year service life goal. Um, so this is some of the strongest concrete that we've produced you know, anywhere in this country, um, and we have some experts on site you know, that do a lot of, the, uh, do a lot of the, the spread testing, load testing, and whatnot. Um, you know, with the with that concrete, uh, with, with the concrete. If you like, you know, we can uh, we can exchange some information. I can get you uh, I can get you some more info on that one. Um, actually, tomorrow morning we have a we have a high school coming in from uh, from New Jersey, and one of our concrete experts is going to uh, is going to speak to them a little bit before we go through our uh, we'll go through our uh, educational materials. Caesar. Is the walking bike on the north span or the south span? 
the bike and walking path is on the northern span, uh, so that is the one that goes from Westchester back to Rockland, uh, and it's on the north side of the northern span. So facing the upper Hudson Valley, and one of those overlooks will allow you to see towards the city yeah, skyline. I'm not sure if it was the artist's rendering, uh, maybe because the center span between the towers may have seen considered as a higher level. <coughs> Or stays on the shoreline side, the top. The, uh, let's see if I can find you uh, a picture. Uh, so the, uh, so it's it's very symmetric. Uh, the, the further away that you get from the towers, you need more of those cables to support, uh, to support the road deck. Um, so instead, because elsewhere along the crossing you have uh, you have concrete piers holding up the road deck. At the main span, it's the cables that allow you to create a span wide, that wide. So the further away that you get from the towers, you'll need some more. Uh, you'll, you'll need more cables. Yeah, I know. But on, on the shore side, like, for instance, on this, on the left side. Yes. I don't know if it's hard as rendering, but there are piers visually. You need a higher concentration of cables at the top than those coming from the top that go to the center. I believe that's just uh, that's just a, that's perspective. I mean, all the yeah, the cables all do attach high up on the towers, and there are more that uh, that more you know cl clustered near the top because they have to support you know those deck sections that are further away from the towers. Um, the yes, the main span itself is symmetrical. It's not situated right in the middle of the bridge. It's the deep water channel. No, I mean, it's between the towers. Half of between the towers. Yeah. It's the same to the shoreline side. Yes. You're saying one side looks less than the other side. Are the span, the cables the same length on either side? So for, from one bridge to the next, if I understand your uh, question, yes, they are the same side. The cables themselves, you know, the ones closer towards the towers, these are um, somewhere around a little over 100 feet, maybe closer to 150. The far, these t these cables are over no. 600 feet long. He means the pole all the way at the end. The set. Yes, 12, 12 cables coming off each tower is 192. I'm not sure if I'm answering this. Answer the question correctly. One yeah. final question. Oh. All right. You know, we just had the election. And one of the issues was the source of the steel. Now, yeah. is this is the source of the steel, the steel ingots from which the beams were constructed. Did that come from China? No. There is a Buy American provision on the project. The steel has to be sourced domestically within the states. No steel of the ingots that was used to form that also is the U.S. I don't actually, actually don't know when the ingot is, <laughs> um, but no, there's a Buy American provision on the project, so that means the steel has to be sourced within the states. I've, personally, I don't know what an ingot is, um, but the, those, that steel is sourced here within the, uh, within the states. Daniel, outstanding job. Outstanding.